This is a Your Wave production at www.yourwave.ca. I am Michael Mehta, and you are listening to The Tsunami, a series of podcasts designed to enrich your academic experience by providing context, opinion, and analysis of course-related topics. On this episode of The Tsunami, we explore the topic of geothermal energy. Although the average person knows very little about geothermal energy, the heat from the Earth is constantly available and eminently renewable. And as an energy source for producing electricity, hot water, and co-products, geothermal power has the potential to provide cost-effective energy that neither contributes to global warming nor threatens national security. The technique for exploiting geothermal power is very simple in principle and somewhat analogous to some of the well-established techniques and practices that are already used for extracting oil and natural gas. But of course, the main difference is that heat flows from the earth because of the massive temperature differences between the surface and the interior, with the temperature at the center of the earth around 7,000 Celsius. So why is the earth hot? Well, there are two main reasons and two different ways in which geothermal can be exploited. When the Earth formed around 4,600 million years ago, the interior heated rapidly, and the kinetic and gravitational energy of material was converted into heat. But of far greater importance today is a second mechanism, namely the tiny quantities of radioactive isotopes, principally thorium-232, uranium-238, and potassium-40, all of which are naturally occurring in rock, and as they decay, they give off heat and heat energy. And this heat is transferred through the Earth principally by convection. To understand better how we can actually capitalize upon this process and to produce electricity and other things, I'd like you to introduce you to Justin Crewson. Justin is a policy advisor with the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association, CANGEA, and we connect with him in his office in Calgary. Thank you for joining us today, Justin. uh, For our audience, could you give us a little bit of a geothermal 101 on what it is and how it works? So basically, what we do to produce geothermal power is we look for hot water heated by the center of the Earth, and we look to pull that water from under the surface and put it through turbines to produce power. And that, in a nutshell, is what geothermal power is. Now, it's important not to mix this up with geo exchange, which many people do. Now, those are pipes placed a meter or two below your house, and they use the temperature differential to heat and cool your house. We are not geo exchange. We actually go much deeper, and we're pulling hot water up to produce power. Now, we actually go down deep, so up to three kilometers and even more. And we're actually using heat that's coming from the center of the Earth. Now, what we're generally looking for, there are various types of geothermal. So there's the magmatic stuff. Um, now, that's usually found around in volcanic regions and whatnot. But uh, you can also use what's called hot sedimentary aquifer geothermal. So that's a, that's a newer type of geothermal and that's been being developed in the uh since the 1980s and that's basically uh just large sedimentary basins that just have a lot of hot water below the earth and they're being heated by the earth and we just basically look to extract that water so whether it's magmatic or hot sedimentary aquifer or uh anything else we're looking for hot water under the surface and we pull it up and we use it to run a steam turbine and yeah that's basically how we produce power uh, is, is there a lot of potential here in British Columbia and in Canada in general to exploit it for electricity production? Yeah, certainly. So as, as you're saying, there's basically heat being generated from the Earth everywhere. Now, um, of course, there is better resources in various spots on the Earth. Now, volcanic resources and ones that are generally the conventional cell geothermal, they're generally associated with like hot springs and what geologists refer to as surface manifestations. Basically, see the hot water bubbling to the surface. Now, um, not many people know that Western Canada actually has around uh, over 100 hot springs in it. So there's um, good, just, you know, layman's terms, surface indications of a geothermal resource in Western Canada. 
Now, um, the problem is that, of course, unlike solar and wind, our stuff is a little harder to get to. So we use various resources to get to this. And um, one way is mapping. So you use data from drilling uh, that's been done. And in Canada, actually, drilling companies are required to report data from the drilling. So we actually have a pretty good idea of various temperatures, of various depth around Canada. Now, the problem is not a lot of this data being compiled. However, Cangia has done that. So we did that for BC, Alberta, and we just recently got a grant to do it for Yukon. So um, what these two basically indi indicate the type of resource you have. Now, there's a lot of white space you see, because a lot of it obviously has not been drilled, and that's usually in the interior. But there are various spots that have been drilled, specifically in the northeast of BC, and uh, using the temperatures that already exist, and we just compiled the data, and we have occasions that there actually is quite a good resource in BC. And that's just for data that we know of. Now, um, you know, that doesn't even include the large white space that's basically in BC's interior, but the uh, surface manifest manifestations are any indication, and they often are. Um, there's quite a good geothermal resource there. Now, just one other thing I'll point out. Um, U.S. and Mexico, they're currently the first and fourth largest producers of geothermal power in the world. Now, um, and then Alaska also has projects online. So if you basically go up the coast of North America, geothermal production all the way up the west coast, it stops at BC and then it goes into Alaska again. Now that's kind of questionable because, you know, geology doesn't really follow political borders. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would say, my very layman's terms opinion, I'm not a geologist or one of our engineers, but yeah, there is a resource that's indicated by our favorite building map. Well, we certainly do have, uh, not too far from where we are in the interior of BC, places like Harrison Hot Springs that uh, are obviously perhaps indicative of, of this resource. What, you, you compared geothermal uh, a, a few minutes ago to solar and wind in terms of its accessibility. Um, geothermal is, is different though, right? I mean, it can be used for things like baseload, is that not correct? Yeah, and that's that's actually the big draw of it. It is a baseload power source. It actually operates new power plants, offer 95% uh, capacity. So, uh, yeah, that is a baseload resource, and that's something that uh, we, we kind of forget about as we bring more of these intermittent energy sources into the mix. Now, wh why is this important? Because basically the other baseload um, capacities that exist are either fossil fuels or nuclear, of course. And, you know, there's obvious some implications associated with both those that uh, we're trying to get away from in terms of like opinion, I think, recently. But um, I'll just, without going on too long, there's something called the duck curve. And this, uh, this was developed in California. And it's basically what various jurisdictions around the world are experiencing as they want more intermittent renewables onto the grid. So what they're getting is a lot of power, essentially, during the day, and the sun's shining, wind's blowing, and all that. But they're not getting power at peak load, which is when people get home from work, turn their lights on, pick in their phones, start cooking, all that stuff. They actually don't have enough power to meet that demand. So in California, as the explode sources of energy are getting retired slowly, um, there's a need to be able to meet this peak demand. And they, going forward in the future, this duck curve represents, um, it just shows basically that they're not going to be able to meet their peak demand, basically, with these intermittent energy sources. So that's where, um, so they're having to actually run stuff like, and might have to build actually coal or like, or other fossil fuel power plants in order to meet this peak demand or just keep them running in order so they can scale up to meet peak demand. Now that's where uh, geothermal power is really beneficial. We we don't have fuel costs, so we can be running essentially for free during the day. We don't emit hardly any GHGs and in battery systems, none, essentially none. And uh, we can be running to meet peak demand. California actually produced a recent bill, and this mandates utilities to consider the integration costs of technologies. Now, this uh, this somewhat penalizes intermittent sources like wind and solar, but it's also a big benefit to geothermal energy because clearly values are benefit to the grid. It uh, mandates that essentially when you're considering solar or wind on the grid, you must consider the backup generation needed in order to meet peak demand. 
Now, um, yes, yeah, so that's been a great pause in California for geothermal energy. I think as more grids around the world move to these intermittent renewable energy sources, geothermal value will just get more and more uh, recognized just because we serve as that base load capacity. When you explain to people how geothermal works and its uh, potential in provinces like British Columbia in particular, what, what kinds of questions or concerns do they typically raise? I think the biggest thing, it's, uh, it's somewhat a chicken the egg argument, but um, a lot of people just say, oh, if it was so great, it'd, it'd be being done. It'd be in Canada. There'd be megawatts produced. As you know, uh, the first geothermal power plant nearly 100 years ago was produced in Italy. So um, that, that's something that we do tackle. Now, a lot of times we just need to uh, come to grips with innovation, the fact that uh, we can do anything that we've set our minds to, especially with a known and an excellent resource, which we have confirmed in BC. Now, further from that, uh, it's a fact that people often don't know that there actually are geothermal projects in Canada. They're just not producing power. So any commercial hot springs you're at, you go to, and there's there's a number in BC. I was actually just at Radium Hot Springs the other weekend. Uh, those are direct use geothermal projects. So direct use is when you just use the hot water for uh, absence other than power. Now there's so many of these. There, there's literally you can do anything that could use a cost source of heat. So hot springs are being done in Canada, and then also in Alberta there's Banff and Jabber hot springs. But I'll just uh, paint a picture of. Uh, how far this resource can be taken. So in Germany, they have basically crummy geothermal resources compared to BC, but they're more comparable to what Alberta has. So they have a lot of hot sedimentary aquifers. Two years ago, a businessman started a project, and uh, he wanted to bring power, district heating, and heat a greenhouse to a little German town. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name because I'll butcher it. But he ended up drilling a well, and he's extracting 90 degrees, 90 degree water, and it's from a depth of 3.5 kilometers. Now, their first harp came in January 2015, and he produced 3,300 tons of tomatoes and 1,100 tons of peppers. He also created 100 jobs with this, and next up is power and also district heating for the community. So, I guess power production is great, but we also should keep in mind that there's so much more you can just resource. So you can produce power and you can also use the water, which is our waste, essentially, warm water. And you use stuff like greenhouses, district heating schemes, you name it. So, uh, yeah, that's, I think just people need to keep their imagination open. And I think especially going forward, as we need more and more pressure for stuff like meaningful carbon taxes and recognize the value that renewable energies have for society as a whole. I, I really think we just keep our minds open and say, because there's no geothermal doesn't mean there won't be or it isn't a good resource. I, I like the direct uh, use examples, and I remember also hearing about the use of uh, heated water in aquaculture uh, for supporting breweries, for instance. Uh, and I remember visiting Iceland a few years ago and uh, spending some time at the Blue Lagoon. And one of the things that um, struck me is that they were able to not only produce electricity with their resources and do district heating and, of course, heat the roads for, uh, you know, to prevent ice formation, but they had all kinds of other co-products with the mineral salts they sell, sold, uh, as well as had a, a tourist destination. Um, do, do we have that kind of opportunity in Canada as well? Certainly. Uh, direct use, as it's termed, well, uh, use of hot water, I guess. That's a little less confusing sometimes for people, but... Using the hot water is a uh, very easy application. It's much lower, it's located at much shallower depths, I should say, and it's actually pretty straightforward technology. So it's, a, it's low risk, and that really is low hanging fruit for Candace. You can do that almost anywhere. And uh, yes, yeah, certainly, it's, it's, a very, it's very exciting, and especially when you look at northern or remote regions too, that have food security issues, and just high cost of living due to, you know, stuff like products having to be trucked in. And that, it's certainly exciting. Yeah, we can certainly do everything that Iceland's doing with their uh, their wastewater, as you call it. I think the most famous one is the Blue Lagoon, which is actually just fed by a power plant in the background. It's a uh, world-class tourist attraction. So, yeah, certainly, why not? Do we, uh, do we have enough data yet to compare in terms of cost uh, geothermal electricity production with other sources of electricity production. Do we know, for example, what on a per megawatt hour basis we're looking at? Yeah, certainly. So um, 
Canvas specific information is the challenge because there's no demonstration projects, there's nothing here, right? So essentially, in the end, if you want to get Canvas specific numbers, you're going to have to have a Canadian geothermal project. So that's, uh, there's no way around that. But you can take other countries, and one I like to use is the U.S. because it's, they're our neighbors. And especially in the BC, a lot of the, the states producing power from geothermal is are right below literally BC. So we have a competitive LCOE. They call that, uh, that's Levelized Cost of Energy is the acronym. And that basically takes the entire life of a project and gets the cost considering the entire project. Now that's really where geothermal energy wins out and becomes competitive with all other energy sources in terms of LCOE because we have zero fuel costs. The problem is that our drilling can take up 30, take, sorry, take up to 30% of the budget of our project. So it's a lot of money up front. Now that's, uh, that's the biggest hurdle we entail. So what do we need? Just government supported mechanisms to de-risk us at the early stages. And, you know, people often say, you not know, one more tax dollar to any private corporation or energy source. If it was so good, they'd develop it themselves. But I think people often forget that nearly every energy source, albeit renewable or fossil fuels, they got started with government support. So we're the same. We're going to need some government support, and we're actually going to need crafted policy mechanisms. There's policy mechanisms available that support renewable energy sources, but they were clearly crafted to solar and wind. We need geothermal specific er, policy mechanisms because geothermal is a hybrid technology. We drill like an extractive resource, but we produce renewable energy just like solar or wind. So I think that's a big issue there with the uh, LCOEs. Let's chat a little bit about um, the drilling and uh, potential environmental and other kinds of impacts of uh, exploring and developing geothermal resources. Uh, are there are there any seismic risks associated with this this practice? Yeah, those again. This is getting more into the technical stuff, so I tend to stray away from this. But I will say, any seismic risks are associated with EGS or what's known as enhanced geothermal systems. Now, those are experimental. They're highly experimental, actually. And as a matter of policy, we don't promote EGS at all in Canada because basically there's lower hanging fruit. We don't need to be doing it. There's a conventional geothermal resources or place all around the country that we can be doing. We don't need to do EGS at this point. Countries that are looking into it are largely in Europe, and they quite literally want to bring power to the cities. So, for example, drill a well in the middle of the city, and produce geothermal power there. We're, we're not looking to do that, and it's a highly experimental technology still. So. Do we have any idea what it would cost to build, say, a, a modest 10 megawatt capacity geothermal facility uh, in this country? Yeah, you know what, again, that's going to be highly contest dependent. So we don't really, like, we have numbers on what a, an average geothermal power plant uh, would cost. Now, I'd have to refer to the experts for that because, again, I'm not an engineer that builds these things. However, it you know, it all depends on scope and scale. And in these especially, they, you guys have a feed and tariff type program that is only applicable to projects 15 megawatts and below. And that's somewhat an obstacle for geothermal energy because while we drill our wells, our wells are generally the same and they cost the same. However, we can produce much more than 15 megawatts with those wells. However, due to the subsidies and the policies that are in effect, projects or potential projects are forced to just produce 15 megawatts. So again, it's another policy hurdle that, you know, was created with other renewables and other energy sources in mind that wasn't necessarily pillared to geothermal energy. What do you see of, as the future of geothermal in, in five years or 10 years? Do we expect to see some plants actually operating? Yeah, certainly. There's actually two projects in BC right now that are shovel ready and they enjoy First Nations and community buy-in. And they're actually just planning drilling right now. So that's exciting. One's in Terrace and one's in Dillon, BC. And yeah, we're excited and hopeful that those will go ahead. There's also a project in Saskatchewan, Esteban. Now that is seeking funding, but it's also shovel ready. And the Yukon, actually, they're doing some exciting stuff there. However, I'm not so familiar with those projects. 
But the future, I really do think, is exciting. So not only getting these some projects off the ground, but I really think it's exciting when you look using the full scale of opportunities that geothermal offers. So again, I'm talking Iceland style. You're not only making power with it, you may have a local community spot, might have a local greenhouse district heating scheme. And then again, when we see uh, how policy is developing here, especially ahead of the Paris Climate Conference, when you see more meaningful carbon taxes and whatnot implemented, this is where it really gets exciting, right? So, um, yeah, I am hopeful and very excited for the future. And that was Justin Cruson, Policy Advisor with the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Tsunami with your host, Michael Mehta, a yourwave.ca production.